Well, we've been talking a lot about the uh, 13 English colonies. Now we're going to talk a little bit about the famous 14th colony that I'm sure you've all heard of, the colony of Vandalia. Well, actually, I'm pretty sure probably none of you have heard of it because it's, it's not famous because it never actually existed. It was a proposed colony. And this, uh, this proposed colony, the whole thing, grew out of uh, a treaty between the English and the uh, Iroquois in New York State in 1768 at a place called Fort Stanwix. And you can see up there uh, the, uh, uh, the star there. That's uh, the location of Fort Stanwix. Uh, essentially, um, during, this, during this meeting, the, the Iroquois uh, ceded some land, some of their land, to the English and also uh, sold some more. Uh, in fact, let's take a look. Uh, let's take a look at, at that. This is the, uh, uh, the lands uh, that the, the Iroquois ceded to the English in Pennsylvania. So if you look at this area, uh, the colony of Pennsylvania started down there in the lower right-hand corner of the state and just kind of grew. Um, and uh, by the, uh, the time of uh, Pontiac's War and uh, the, uh, uh, the stuff we talked about with the uh, Paxton Boys and all that, uh, Pennsylvania was only about one-third the size that it eventually would become. Uh, this treaty gave them, uh, gave to the English, all this uh, land under 1768 that you see down there in the lower left-hand corner and the upper right-hand corner, plus a new purchase that they paid for uh, with trade goods. Uh, that's right there where it says 1768, new purchase. And that, by the way, is the, uh, uh, the section of Pennsylvania where the cities of Wilkes, Barr, and Scranton would later grow. The area that was ceded to the English, all the way on the left-hand corner there where those uh, uh, three rivers are kind of coming together at the very corner. That's the location of the French Fort Duquesne, which had been taken from the French and renamed Fort Pitt. And the city of Pittsburgh would grow up in that area that was ceded by the, uh, the Iroquois. Now, the Iroquois were not native to Pennsylvania. In fact, it was mostly Delaware Indians or uh, Lenny Lenape Indians living in that region. Uh, so why were the Iroquois uh, ceding lands that they didn't live on? Well, remember that the, uh, uh, the, the Iroquois, during the Beaver Wars of roughly the entire 17th century, had expanded significantly from their home territory that was basically all of New York State today, that's in the uh, magenta there, uh, they had expanded out down into Pennsylvania and down below that into what is now uh, Virginia and uh, westward uh, into uh, what is now Michigan and all basically of, of the Midwest uh, because they had those guns initially that they had traded uh, with the Dutch and then the English for. And so they... They took over all this territory, but as I, I explained, they didn't actually move there to live. All this area that they took over, uh, they controlled the hunting in that area. And they chased out uh, a lot of the tribes that lived there. Uh, some of the other tribes that they didn't chase out, who, who remained, uh, still were in conflict with them. But essentially, the Iroquois were controlling this area so that they could control the fur trade and the profits that came from it. So when they're giving that land to Pennsylvania, it's not land where they actually live. It's land that they had claimed basically jurisdiction over. Okay. Now, by 1768, the Iroquois, who had kind of reached their peak around 1700, um, they had been gradually weakened because of those Algonquin tribes they had run a roughshod over that were allied with the French, started getting guns from the French. So the Iroquois were really no longer controlling the hunting even in the Midwestern area. But 
they still laid claim to it by right of uh, conquest, not the ownership of the land, because they didn't uh, they didn't believe in that, but the right to use the land for hunting. So they gave some land to Pennsylvania, uh, but that's not uh, that's not where Vandalia comes into the picture. Uh, that is traced back can be traced back to Pontiac's War and the end of the French and Indian War in 1763 when the English had taken over all those French forts remember and they had taken over the treaty obligations with all those French allied Algonquin speaking Indians and had basically uh, changed the terms of the deal with them uh, and that was one factor that led to this big war where uh, Pontiac and his, uh, his allies spread through and burned down all those forts. Essentially, a large number of English merchants who had been operating trading posts in the Midwest uh, were, uh, were wiped out. And if they, some of them individually were wiped out, uh, but those who were not, their businesses were wiped out in Pontiac's war. So several of them got together and formed uh, what was known as the Indiana Company. And uh, at this point, let's take a look again at that, uh, at that map of the proposed colony that eventually came about almost. You can see the dark area that says Indiana. Uh, that's not the location of the present day state of Indiana, but that is uh, what was claimed by the Indiana Company, which was a consortium of English merchants who had operated trading posts that wanted a grant of land to sort of take the place of what they had lost in the war. So um, that land was granted to them by the English, uh, the English uh, crown. Um, and it was land that was signed over by the Iroquois um, in what is now Ohio, um, which the Iroquois didn't live there. Uh, remember, that's going to turn out to be very important. Well, the Indiana uh, company uh, decided that uh, maybe this might be a good opportunity to ask for more than that. And so they made an alliance with the Ohio company which had been around for about 15 years, and we've talked about, remember, the beginning of the French and Indian War? The Ohio Company were those people, those wealthy people from Virginia, land speculators, uh, who had sent George Washington up into the area, and that started the fighting. Well, they're still around, and so together with those uh, merchants, uh, they asked for even more land, uh, and the Iroquois, in fact essentially sold uh, sold that land in return for trade goods. Now, remember the, um, the Royal Proclamation, the Proclamation of 1763 said that colonists were not allowed to go west of the Appalachian Mountains. And all this territory here is west of the Appalachian Mountains. So the way to try to get around that was um, so they don't want us to go there and fight the Indians and make the Indians mad. But what if the Indians sell us the land? So they bought it from the Iroquois. And then the plan was to make this into a colony, a 14th colony, that would include both the Indiana uh, area that's in the dark there and uh, the rest, all together making up the colony of Vandalia. Uh, there's a problem, though. Uh, the problem was they got this from the Iroquois. The Iroquois did not live west of the Appalachian Mountains. Um, they only claimed this territory, and they didn't even have a very strong claim to it anymore uh, because the tribes who lived there had grown stronger. Uh, and so the tribes that lived there, who had allied together in Pontiac's war because the English, they felt, had been screwing them over, are still living there, and they're certainly not going to be happy about this. So the English government refused to recognize all these, uh, 
uh, arrangements that had been made by the Ohio Company and refused to allow the colony of Vandalia to move forward. Now, this is 1768. What happened instead, eventually, is that with that land, uh, that part of the land that was east of the Appalachian Mountain chain, uh, that's over there in Pennsylvania, uh, that was seeded, uh, I remember where Pittsburgh and everything is, uh, some of that was claimed already by, um, well, it's claimed by the colony of Pennsylvania, but uh, uh, the colonies of Virginia and Maryland also claimed it uh, because it was right around in there where those three colonies uh, that were later states, of course, came together. So the year before this treaty had been signed, uh, there had been a couple of surveyors employed by the uh, the colonial governments of Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Virginia, guys named uh, two guys named Charles Mason and Jeremiah Dixon, and they had established the southernmost border of the colony of Pennsylvania already. So all of this stuff that was gained in Pennsylvania in uh, the Treaty of Fort Stanwix from the Iroquois up in New York, that's all north of this line. That, uh, that became known as the Mason-Dixon Line. Now, later on, the Mason-Dixon Line is not just going to be known for separating you know, these three colonies, three competing colonies, but it's going to be uh, eventually in the 19th century the line that separates the slave states of Maryland and Virginia uh, from the uh, free state of Pennsylvania. So, anyway... Very long story made very short. They tried to make a colony in Vandalia, and uh, they weren't allowed to do it. Well, the whole Vandalia plan may have been eventually shut down. But before it was, while there was still some discussion uh, and uh, some lobbying to, to try to get this done by the... Uh, uh, the members there of the Indiana Company and Ohio Company. During that time period, individuals from the uh, colonies of Pennsylvania and Virginia started crossing over the Appalachian Mountains and into that territory that uh, was proposed to be a part of Vandalia. Uh, some of them uh, traveling far to the uh, the western end of that proposed area. Um, and that brings us, again, some people, not a whole lot, because traveling over the Appalachian mountain chain was not an easy thing to do. But some people, some people did it to go out and trade with the Indians out there or to hunt. Uh, and uh, one of those individuals was this guy, Daniel Boone, born in 1734, so he is in his uh, mid-30s at this point. He had been, uh, well, he was raised in Pennsylvania Colony in a Quaker family, um, but um, there had been a falling away from the Quaker faith uh, by uh, the, the father and several of the uh, uh, the, the children, including Daniel Boone. Mother remained a faithful Quaker. Anyway, uh, Boone had been, during the very beginning of the French and Indian War, and I think we mentioned this at that time, uh, he was part of the Braddock Expedition. Uh, he was a wagon driver. That was that uh, English military expedition that was one of the first major battles of the French and Indian War where the English got their butts kicked and remember, uh, George Washington was there. Uh, so Boone was involved in that. After that, uh, his family moved, he and his family moved from Pennsylvania to North Carolina Colony. And while there, he joined the militia and was a scout for the uh, North Carolina militia during the Anglo-Cherokee War. In fact, uh, for two solid years, he was away from his from his family, from his wife and children, uh, while he was off fighting 
against the Cherokees. Well, late 1760s, about a decade after all that had happened, he's one of the individuals that crosses over uh, into um, that, uh, that area, the proposed uh, colony of Vandalia, and to the far western end of it, uh, the area known as Kentucky. And he made his first trip there in 1769. Uh, he was there to hunt. These, these guys, guys like him, who traveled usually in small groups, were known as long hunters uh, because, uh, you know, they'd go on a hunting trip. It wasn't for the weekend. It was for months or sometimes years. And then they would uh, make their way back to the colonies with the uh, furs, uh, the pelts that they had gathered. So, his first trip into uh, what would later be Kentucky came in 1769. Some other prominent long hunters included a guy named Casper Mansker, who was of German descent. He was also from Pennsylvania. I remember a lot of German immigrants lived there. Um, Mansker was actually raised in the colony, um, so he would have spoken uh English and German, both pretty well. He was born on the ship on the way across the ocean to Pennsylvania when his family moved to the colony. Uh, so he made his way down into Middle Tennessee uh, in 1769, making him one of the first Europeans in the area. Uh, later on, he would, uh, he would set up a trading post when more people were living in the area, this was like uh, many years after that, called Mansker's Station uh, in what is now Goodlettsville, Tennessee. Uh, another long hunter who is pictured here in these two illustrations was uh, from Virginia, Thomas Sharp Spencer, known by the nickname Bigfoot because he was a huge guy. Uh, uh, allegedly, he was like, you know, close to seven feet tall, so he would have had pretty big feet. Uh, he came uh, into the area, and then uh, later, eventually, in the uh, mid to late 1770s, he stayed over the winter. He, he stayed permanently instead of coming for a hunting trip and leaving in um, what is now uh, Sumner County. And he, had, he was on his own. He was uh, uh, living and hunting on his own living uh, part of the time in a cave because the Cherokees and the Shawnees uh, did not want any of these people in their territory, as we will see. So he lived in a cave part of the time, and then he lived also in a really big, inside a really big hollow tree. Um, the, uh, the town of Spencer, Tennessee, in Van Buren County, is named after this guy and we're going to talk about him again a little bit later on he comes back into our story uh, one other individual to mention um, came a different route he was not one of the long hunters who came over the mountains from the english colonies he actually came from due north he was french canadian and uh, his name was timothe de montbrun and uh, he came down into what is now the northern part of Middle Tennessee uh, as a hunter and uh, actually set up, uh, he built a cabin near, uh, near a big salt lick. It was a big, basically, you know, a big chunk of, uh, of, of salt that animals would come to and, and lick on to get their, to get their, uh, their sodium intake. Uh, and so he lived near there. When, when English people started moving into the area, and he was already there, they called the place uh, near where his cabin was French Lick. And uh, that area, as more and more English settlers later moved into it, uh, became known uh, first as Fort Nashboro and later as Nashville. And uh, Timothée de Montbrun, uh, was living there, one of the uh, prominent early city citizens. But, you know, you know how English-speaking people are. They don't like them weird foreign names. So they just called him Timothy de Munbrian. So if you've ever driven in Nashville, 
Uh, there's uh, one, of, one of the main streets is Demunbrian. And uh, if, if you're like me and virtually everyone else that doesn't know this story, um, you wonder what the heck kind of name that is. It's actually an uh, anglicization of de Montbrun. Uh, so, anyway, uh, these hunters uh, started coming into the area. Uh, they were sort of the first trickle of, um, of English colonists, although, you know, de Montbrun wasn't English. Now, while we're on this subject, uh, several of the uh, pictures we've already looked at and several that we will see, you've got these long hunters wearing coats like this. And, and you've seen this before, right? If you've seen anything of the old pioneer days, uh, whether it's Daniel Boone, Davy Crockett, or whatever, you've seen these uh, uh, buckskin jackets. Uh, buckskin, of course, if, if you're not in the know, means deer skin, a male deer, uh, with the, uh, the fringes on it. That's also associated with Native Americans. And in fact, uh, it's associated with uh, Native Americans that are in the eastern woodland tribes, north and south. They had uh, shirts like this that they wore in the wintertime which is when they did most of their hunting, and so they called them hunting shirts. Now, they didn't wear these things year-round because they got pretty darn hot in the summer, but in the late fall and the winter, uh, it was very uh, common that you would see American Indians wearing uh, this type of garment, and then the, uh, the English hunters who came over kind of adopted this style of dress. A lot of times they would also have fringes down the sides of their of their pants uh, because well i guess today we might assume because it looks really cool but uh, that's not really uh, the reason it wasn't uh, solely for decorative purposes those fringes serve a practical purpose uh, from the time they were worn by the native americans uh, forward and essentially if you're on one of these long hunts whether you're a cherokee or whether you're from Pennsylvania and you're a white guy, if you're on these long hunts, you're living outdoors in the rain and the snow and whatever, but particularly you're going to be worried about the rain because if you get wet, you know, if you get soaked through, you might get pneumonia and die. Well, uh, that's where these fringes come from. The, the, the purpose of the little tassels, the little fringes coming down, is that when the water uh, starts soaking into your clothing, the water will run down these fringes and then flow off of you so that you're not, not soaking as much of the water into your clothes. That's what that's for. So that's just one of uh, many adaptations uh, that were, well, many things that were adopted by the early... Uh, early hunters, the fur trappers and long hunters from the, the Native Americans. So anyway, back to Daniel Boone. Here's another uh, painting of Daniel Boone with his uh, buckskin outfit there with all of his fringes ready for, ready for a strong rain. Well, um, after going on several of these long hunts, um, Boone led about 30 or 40 people into that uh, uh, that land known as Kentucky, even though by this point the whole Vandalia thing was out the window, wasn't going to happen. He still uh, led 30 or 40 uh, people uh, to uh, make a settlement, uh, what was going to be the first settlement in uh, what's now Kentucky, in 1773. So the first English colonists that uh, tried to permanently settle west of the Appalachian Mountains in that area that, remember, uh, according to the Proclamation of 1763, was off-limits for English colonists and was reserved for Indians. So, really, you may have heard about Daniel Boone before, and you may have even read about him in school and about him being a pioneer and a trailblazer and all that stuff, all of which is true. Also, uh, it is true, you know, that's... Uh, that takes a very hardy individual. It takes a very bold and courageous individual. But one thing that you may not have known, 
was this was all illegal. Uh, they were illegal squatters uh, coming into this area. And the, uh, the, the, the Indians didn't like it. In fact, in fact, as this started happening, first with some individuals and then small groups of individuals, and now dozens of people trying to start a settlement, the Shawnees and the Cherokees, both of whom claimed Kentucky as their hunting grounds, um, not necessarily, you know, the Cherokees didn't live in Kentucky, uh, but they claimed it as their hunting grounds. Uh, Cherokees and Shawnees had been enemies for a long time at this point, for several generations. They were bitter enemies. But at this point in the 1770s, they actually set aside their hatred for one another and started working together against the English colonists, who later would be called Americans. And they... Uh, uh, they started doing this, uh, and, and they uh, uh, put an end to this attempted settlement. And the end came when a small group of, uh, of young men was cut off from the main group and attacked by a force of Cherokees and Shawnees working together. And they captured two, uh, two young men who were in their teens, uh, late teens, uh, Henry Russell and James Boone, son of Daniel Boone, and they tortured them to death. Uh, this put a big damper on, uh, uh, on efforts to uh, have this uh, settlement uh, placed in the area, and uh, Boone and the others uh, withdrew. They, they abandoned that settlement because there weren't enough of them to withstand the Cherokees and Shawnees who were determined to drive them out. But, uh, no surprise here, uh, that wasn't the end of the story. So there's going to be more settlers. But also, the, this incident, uh, the death of James Boone and Henry Russell, would be the first incident, they basically considered the beginning, the first salvo, of a bitter war between the uh, Shawnees particularly, uh, but also with their Cherokee allies against the colonies of, well, especially the colony of Virginia, because it was mostly Virginians who were coming over. Uh, and this was going to be known as Lord Dunmore's War. Uh, Lord Dunmore, by the way, was the royal governor of the Virginia colony. And uh, this was the beginning of it.